we're going Dutch. Goose hunting. We pop over to see the neighbours and discover how government licensing affects their shooting. I think maybe 10,000 euros of damage. Ben Hustwaite is showing us how to fit and balance your shotgun using a very neat trick. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. fun we've been having with the general licences in the UK, we thought it would be interesting to see how our neighbours deal with pest control and crop damage. So we've come to the Netherlands, 200-ish miles from London, half an hour from Rotterdam, and the geese are munching and crunching their way across the fields. We've been invited by Igor Timmermans, editor of Holland's only hunting magazine, Weidmanshael, to meet his hunting buddy Bastian Maris. Bastian is a keen and busy goose shooter, especially at this time of year. He has licences to shoot barnacle geese, protected in the UK, grey lags out of season in the UK, and Egyptian geese and Canada geese that were under general licences in the UK because they are costing the farmers dear. More about that in a moment. First, let's find out what efforts need to be made by the farmer to deter the birds. We are going through a change with our licensing, but what's important is that you've made efforts to scare the birds to start with. So yes. effort, what efforts do you make? Uh, we make uh, the square, uh, the, how do we call them? Scarecrow? Yeah. We've got sticks with flags on it. Some farmers uh, put the car uh, in the field. Over there you see one uh, standing. Or a trailer will also help, mostly for a week. And then the geese get used to it. And then uh, you can remove the trailer because uh, they have no use anymore <laughs> to scare them off. You were saying that the, the flags are actually an indicator for the geese that there's food. <laughs> yes, that, that's true. <laughs> When we started to put the flags, it, we, uh, it was necessary because the government asked us to put them over there. But uh, geese get used to it. And now when the geese see those flags standing, then they know, hey, we have to, can go over there and uh, let's eat. So it's like the, the golden arches of McDonald's. Yeah, like that, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, just like in the UK, scaring the birds is a necessary part of the control effort. However, shooting is not the last resort. It's part of the strategy. Travelling along a dike, we stop to film geese feeding on a wheat crop. Can you estimate how many, how many geese would be there? 350 to 400 geese and a, a few uh, swans. But the, the swans were uh, earlier, there were more. There were already hundreds and they eat almost like cows, <laughs> as many, <laughs> so <laughs> you don't want to have them on your uh, crops. The goose numbers can be such an issue here, the government famously employed a controversial method of mass control around Schiphol Airport. They gassed the geese using carbon monoxide. It sounds horrendous. The idea is the geese can still be used in the food chain, mainly for animal feed. Now, uh, Igor, this is a big area where they do a lot of damage. Probably he has to uh, harvest his wheat in two times because on the back the wheat is uh, uh, good enough for harvesting earlier yeah. than uh, so he on has this. The expenses for all, the all the driving, uh, fuel, everything. Can we compare it. We took a plant over there and now you can see the big difference. 
here with the damage the geese do on the crops. So it must cost the farmer a lot of money. I think maybe 10,000 euros wow. of damage. Now what happens? Does the government get involved in this? Is there compensation? They get compensation for it, but he has to do all kind of efforts to get the geese off his, his crops. It includes also the hunters to shoot some geese, yeah. uh, but it never covers the whole uh, financial uh, loss of, for the farmer. Now, normally the wildfowlers are a nocturnal bunch keeping very antisocial hours. Not here. It's about 5.30 yeah. <laughs> in the afternoon and we're setting up. Now I put the decoys in the kind of uh, the, the Nike logo <laughs> and the meaning is of, that the geese are falling in, in the round thing. If the geese are turning uh, further in or wider then we have to uh, change positions uh, so we can get them uh, in a clear shot. Steel shot is a requirement and Bastian explains why he uses Gamebore HV Steel with a 3 and 4 combo. The theory behind it is that the column of the shot spreads uh, less than normally when you use 3 or 4s. And now they are combined and then first you cut the 4s go up front, the tree is coming behind it and the impact on, on the animal is much better than when you use only a four or a five. How is the shot packed into the cartridge? Well, first on the back, you've got the trees, like also it's printed on the cartridge and the four up front. They are not mixed together. There's not a lot of hide building required as we just drop down into a ditch using the reeds and grasses as cover. It doesn't take long before the first geese cross our path. Mauser, Bastian's German wirehead pointer, is on call to retrieve the birds that fall. Bastian takes 300 to 400 geese every year and although he's a big fan, he'd like to see the market grow. These geese will go to some friends of mine who eat uh, or, or ate them and the Barningo geese will go to uh, for dog training. To, they are smaller and they, easy, uh, they are easier for the dog to, to fetch. But uh, as you have seen, my dog is a little bit bigger and they <laughs> he can catch the grey leg uh, also. He doesn't have a problem uh, with it. With uh, uh, when they're, they're training them just to purely pick up barnacle geese. Uh, uh, no, also pigeons and ducks. Okay. But uh, most people like them because they're a little bit smaller and easier to handle than the big grey leg ones. So. Bastian and his friend feel that the pattern needs moving to swing the birds in closer. It works and they take their chances. So come on then, we always ask this, what's the best tasting goose? <laughs> I think the barnacle geese tastes very good and, uh, and the Egyptian, Egyptian geese also. But uh, most times I smoke the breast and they taste all good, so it doesn't matter for me. <laughs> At the end of the evening, we have 28 grey lag, three barnacles and an Egyptian goose. I lost my car, I can't find it anymore. <laughs> it's fascinating to see how other countries manage their own particular pest problems and how they have to work with all the different laws that all the different governments come up with. Thank you, Igor and Bastian. And I believe that's the first time we have filmed any hunting in the Netherlands. Now, from golden geese to a lame duck, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. The huntsman of the Grafton Hunt has been found not guilty of illegal fox hunting. 
The defence at the trial at Northampton Magistrates Court claimed that the Grafton was hunting to a bird of prey, using the Falconer's exemption in the Hunting Act as their defence. During the trial of Mick Wills, an independent expert proved himself to be not so independent when he kissed prosecution witness Judy Gilbert in greeting. The district judge then excluded controversial anti-hunting fox expert Professor Stephen Harris from the trial. Antis don't always have it their own way. Small groups of antis gathered in town centres across Yorkshire last Saturday to protest against Yorkshire Water allowing grouse shooting on its land. Local man Simon Grace protested back. In Ilkley he butted in on everyone that thought about signing the League Against Cruel Sports petition. He says he was sworn at, but he won. After two hours, Lax packed up and left. If you want to help Simon counter future protests, contact him via Facebook. Link is in the description below. You've just got to know where to look, says the North Yorkshire Moors Moorland Association. The antis are using social media to complain there's no biodiversity on grouse moors when the opposite is true. A volunteer from the British Trust for Ornithology accompanied a North Yorkshire gamekeeper onto the moors and ringed 83 chicks, including 16 curlew, 18 golden plover and 49 lapwing, all in just one morning. This film from the association shows an osprey over a grouse moor getting a hard time from a corvid, not a gamekeeper. Scotland could soon follow England into the general licences chaos. Scottish Natural Heritage is to hold a 12-week consultation later this year on whether or not to bow to Chris Packham's legal threats. The RSPB is using the consultation to lash out at grouse shooting. It claims the general licences are as cover to increase shootable surpluses of game birds. Police have been asked to investigate the Orkney Stoat Cull, which is costing the taxpayer £7 million. The Scottish Gamekeepers Association passed photographs to the police of the traps being used to rid the island of the animal. The SGA says that the project is breaking the law by using the wrong traps. Target Sprint is back for the 2019 season. As well as the National Series, a new Super League has been created, with points awarded to the top finishers at each event. This is the South West Qualifier, where Emily Scheuer continued her dominance in the Super League Youth Women with another gold, whilst Callum Fricker took the Super League Junior Men's category in style. Newcomers Lucy Woolley and Donna Throngmorton were inspired by their children Seth and Erin to give it a go. Exeter school pupil Tom Gray was crowned the South West Youth Men Champion and secured his place at the National Series Final, as did Lily Howe, who took gold in the Junior Women class. Thanks to shareholder Andy McGarty for sending this on. A rewilding fanatic plans to release wildcats into the British countryside. Part funded by the Goldsmith family, Derek Gow wants to produce 150 wildcat kittens a year. He is building an enclosure for them in Devon and plans to stock it with imported wildcats. Petrol head Jeremy Clarkson is ditching cars for crops. He's announced a new series about his passion for farming. The 59-year-old former Top Gear presenter lives on a 1,000-acre farm in Chipping Norton in Oxfordshire, where he grows wheat, barley and oilseed rape. Filming's already begun for the new series, I Bought the Farm, which will be aired in September on Amazon Prime. As we reported, in Fieldsports Island, the European Union is trying to ban lead in shot and fishing weights. The National Association of Regional Game Councils in Ireland is fighting back against the law, which could make 100,000 guns obsolete. Find out more at nargc.ie. Meanwhile, hunting organisations are encouraging German shooters to say no to tighter gun regulations. You can support their petition at bit.ly forward slash German gun law. Sticking with Germany and you can now shoot wolves in the country. Germany slightly relaxed its tough laws on the culling of wolves on Wednesday, amid concern growing numbers pose a threat to livestock. Under new rules introduced by Angela Merkel's government, licensed hunters will be called in to shoot wolves where there have been clear attacks on livestock. Botswana's to get its wildlife back. The South African country has seen sense and lifted its suspension on hunting. The Botswana government imposed a suspension on hunting in 2014, and since then thousands of animals have been killed by locals who see no value in them, or died because hunting operators moved out of the country. And finally, a militant vegan is winding up liberals in Australia. 
James Warden, 25-year-old leader of Direct Action Everywhere, is saying discrimination against animals is as evil as racism. He's just appeared in court accused of stealing a cow and a dead piglet from farms in Western Australia. He admits trespassing but denies stealing the animals. He's back in court in July. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stuck in the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. And you can see more news on the front page of our website. Quickest way to get there, F Channel. Now, a speedy mention for viewer Brian Jobling, who recently won a kite scope in a competition in Field Sports Britain. Here's his rifle loaded up with a new scope. Thank you, Kite Optics. Now, Ben shows us how to load up and balance a shotgun with Game Ball cartridges. So, one of the things we've been asked to cover is gun fit. So I've got a student and friend of mine along here, Alfie Tibbles. Alfie's been doing very well in the Colts category. So it's, you know, his body is changing weekly. So it's something we're gonna to have to keep our eye on. So what we've done, we've got a, a Browning Pro Sport here that Alfie shoots. I've put everything back to how it would have come from the box. And then we're gonna go through a fitting with him. Hopefully talk you guys through the key components to a good gun fit that you can either you know, see somebody else or try and have a bash at it yourself at home. So before we do anything, everything we're gonna do for the next few minutes is gonna be with an empty gun. Okay, the gun is empty when Alfie's pointing it at me and waving it around, there can be no accidents. So first thing I want you to do, Alfie, is just mount it straight up towards the corner of that, that white door for me. So when Alfie's mounted the gun now, what I'm looking for is the pitch here and the length of pull. So we can see that's miles too short for him, so we can't really get a good idea of the pitch yet. The reason I say it's too short for him, what I'm looking for is the angle in his elbow here. I'm looking for an open, open degrees of, of his elbow here. What you'll get, let me relax a minute, mate. What you'll get is a lot of people say, you know, you've got to be three fingers from your thumb. Again, doesn't mean anything to me. And also you get people that say you rest it in your arm here. That's a very good for telling you how long your arm is. And that's simply, all it is good for is telling you how long your arm is, right? So one more time, Alfie, let's just get a few measurements. Finger back where I've just told you. We'll go through that yep. in a minute. And now mount. So we're gonna add a substantial amount to the back first, get him on the length of pull right, and then we're gonna work our way forward. There's absolutely no reason for me to check the uh, eye on the rib yet, because that's gonna change when we alter this. Thank you, mate. Before I make any adjustments, I'm just gonna check the balance Alfie holds his gun right at the end of the fore end here. So we're gonna be looking for around the hinge pin as balance if it was further back. We may shift that, but with him being forward, the, the hinge pin is directly between the center of his hands. Now, if I finger the hinge pin here and let go, what I want that to do is either sit still or very slowly come back towards the stock, and this is not going to. Considerably front heavy, for me, that's unshootable. Not just a Browning. Most guns will come that way. So when you check yours, make sure you measure between the center of your hands and then find the point. That's gonna be far too heavy. As we can see, we've got a barrel weight already affixed to the gun here. So I'm gonna remove that, recheck the balance after I've finished the length of pull issue. Okay, so first things first, Alfie. Yep. Let's get this off. So we've got some spacers here, we've got some washers here that we're gonna to use to make a temporary temporary gun fit. Um, again, because of how old are you now, Alfie? I'm 15. You know, 15 years old, Alfie's still growing, so I'm not gonna make any permanent changes. We're not gonna send the gun away and have expensive changes made because a growth spurt and the gun will no longer fit him. So everything we're gonna to do today will be done temporary and then we'll just keep assessing it through further lessons. If we go again between the hinge pin, we're now gonna be just rocking backwards. Yep. And for me, that's exactly as I would want that, mate. So we've got a little bit more weight towards yep. the back. If I explain that to you better than that, if I put a piece of blue tack on the wall here and I took a sledgehammer and I could only hold 
the wooden handle here, that's going to leave the heavy end out in front and ask you to hit that thing on the head, it's going to be very difficult for you to do. If I turn that round, put the heavy end of the hammer here and only have the shaft out in front, I can put that yeah. wherever you want to. So when we're on a future lesson, I'm saying to you, right, Alfie, I want you to start just behind it or start on it. It's going to be a lot easier when the barrel is the lightest part yeah. of the shotgun, mate. Okay, that's the reason we've done that. So gun's empty again. If you can just uh, mount that up for me this time, Alfie. How's that feel? Feels much better coming up. Again, Alfie's very low in his shoulder pocket, that's like me. So the pitch is actually quite good. We've got full contact at the back, the pitch being the angle between the toe and the heel of the gun at the back here. Again, now we've opened out the elbow. His left hand has come off the barrel. So it's now been reduced onto the forend where it should be. And this is actually gone onto the front foot. So that's a lot better posture there. Good mate, I'm lower that now. If you come across it, so you don't have a front weight to take off. What I tend to do is take off the recoil pad. You'll have a stop bolt hole. I pack that stop bolt out with, with tissue paper. And then what I would do is take a cartridge and I would cut it through the wad, not through the powder, not through. So what happens is I then get a 28 gram weight. You can add them into the stop bolt hole, therefore creating a temporary balance change to allow you to trial it out before you do any changes. If we cut through the wad, all the dangerous bit is here, that can be cast away, and we're left with a perfect one ounce weight, which will fit perfectly in the stock bolt hole. Therefore, we load that up till we get the correct balance. As I said, what most people would do is drop that in without any tissue, and then you just end up filling this. We need so much weight to affect a balance change. By using the tissue paper first, and just dropping this in here, we actually create a huge balance shift and making the gun far more shootable. So Alfie, we're happy with the pitch, yeah. we're happy with the length, and now we're gonna have a look at your eye, mate, okay? So I'm gonna be in front of you, the gun's empty. Yeah. So if you just mount the gun up one more time towards my finger for me. Yeah. Okay, I don't know if you'll be able to see down here, but the gun's way, way, way too low for Alfie. You can see, we can see nothing of his eye. So that's gonna create Alfie to lift his head. When I've got the weight, mate, I can feel you shaking. Just relax a bit. <laughs> I've got the, um, that's gonna cause Alfie to lift his head when he takes the shot. If I can just take the gun from you, Alfie. Yeah. So what happens is he mounts, he's very low on the comb. He wants to see the clay to have a look. He lifts his head up. His left hand follows his eyesight and there's a clear miss over the top. So all the experts go, Alfie, you're missing miles over the top. Your gun must be too high. When actually it's the reverse. He's far too low, hence the head lift, therefore the front hand traveling up. Yeah. So we're just gonna do that one more time, just so I make sure that we've got a consistent mount. We're certainly not gonna fit a gun off just one mount. So one more time. What I'm looking for is to make sure Alfie mounts it in the same place. He's not got an inconsistent mount. I'm very happy that that's in exactly the same place. And we are far, far too low. Okay, so what we're doing now is just loosening off Alfie's comb here, adjustable stock to allow us to raise it up. What I'm gonna try and do, because of the shape of this Pro Sport, the stock will come off on an angle. So if I raise it up, what I'm gonna create is the stock to come up like this. Therefore, we get the correct stock height, but when Alfie takes a shot, he's gonna get a smack in the cheek. So we're gonna raise it more at the back than the front, trying to create as best we can a parallel comb, okay? So we're gonna come up considerably and then just create that little bit of a tip. Therefore, your dad's not ringing me up telling me you got to you got smack in the chops. Interestingly, um, over lunch, Alfie informed me that he's now changed chokes. Are these the titanium ones? Yeah, these are the teak titanium. So these are the, the titanium chokes. If he was using a different choke, we may have to rebalance it. Titanium, obviously, we don't know is lighter. So yeah. we're gonna balance it to the chokes you're gonna be using now. Yeah. If it was back on the regular steel one, they're obviously gonna be heavier. That could have a huge impact on the balance being so far forward. So yeah. it's a good job we've got those in, those in now, mate. So okay, just mount that forward for me. Okay, so now we've got Alfie's eye up above the rib. 
we can now see is no longer in line either. We're off to the left hand side. So we're gonna to have to, again, reduce it, bring it over. And a gun fit is not a two minute job. It's not something you're gonna do in five minutes. These people that say we can do it, you know, some you get right first time, it's trial and error. You have to, you have to get it spot on. So we need to lift it some more and we need to then bring you over this way, mate. So we're gonna make quite a lot of changes when you're ready, sir. Just try that one more time. So we've now altered cast, height, length, and balance. How's that look to you now? Yeah, that's looking better on the other. Yeah, yeah I mean, that looks very nice. Again, I still think we're too low. Yeah. Are, it's running straight into the black of your eye. I want you up above the rib to give us a better point of impact. So yeah. one more change, and I believe, Alfie, you'll be ready to go, mate. So I'm quite happy now that that gun is perfectly fitted to Alfie now. The only thing that could change that is when you get on the range and he doesn't actually mount as he's done inside. Now that's something quite common that you come in here and you take your time and you make the perfect mount. So I would say eight times out of 10 it works. So what I would do now, we'd go outside, we'd set up a straight incomer at about 30 yards and a trap shot at about 16 yards. Two shots that we know we have to shoot straight at yeah. to break. And that's what I would have, have Alfie shoot is 10 of these and 10 of these. If Alfie's shooting straight at them, seeing the sight picture that he wants to see, and we're in the middle, that to me is the perfect test. Again, as we discussed previously, there's no reason to shoot at a pattern plate. So we don't need to cover that again. You know, we've never been to a competition. They said rabbit on report pattern plate. That's never happened. So yeah. we've never need to shoot one of those. So that would be how I would, if I was doing it myself, test a gun fit. 30 yard incomer, 16 to 17 yard trap shot, Dead straight, two shots we have to shoot straight at to, to, to test if that fits you or not. But I'll, I'll be quite confident, mate, that yeah. we're going to be okay. Thank you, Ben. Now here's a quick one. Viewer Jim Mayer made this contraption. Can you see what it is yet? To find out what time foxes come by and they keep regular habits, attach a fishing line to the battery in the travel clock and tie the other end to the bait. When the fox pulls the rabbit out, the battery pops out and the clock stops. Jim says you need to feed for a week to get the fox to within five minutes of a regular time. Foxes keep regular time. And I went to Ireland last weekend for a good time where I bumped into a not so local hero. Oh, I love it over here. I'll definitely be back over here, I tell you. It's fun, isn't it? Oh, it's a lovely place. Unspoilt. And, and the people? Oh, people, so friendly. It, it, it takes, well, it's like today, it's, it's taken me hours to get anywhere. And everyone wants to talk and oh, the main the main topic is uh, general licence, but, but no, they, uh, everyone's so friendly. Mate, met some old friends, made some new ones as well. Nobody likes a shopping outing more than the Northern Irish and their game fair season is well underway with the Scarver Fair here in Armagh. And we've got plenty more coming up. The Irish Game Fair takes place at Chains Castle, County Antrim on the weekend of the 29th and 30th of June, not far from Belfast International Airport. So worth flipping over from Britain for that one. You can click on the link on the screen to watch our film from last year's Irish Game Fair. It's organised by the Great Game Fairs of Ireland. Before it, the same organiser is putting on the Irish Country Lifestyle Festival on Galway Racecourse on the west coast of Ireland on the 15th and 16th of June. As for this show, the Northern Ireland Country Sports Fair at Scarver House, County Armagh, organiser Derek Lusson says it's going well. Happy with the way it's going today. The weather, she couldn't wish for better than that. It's good to see the sun coming out. It's good to see the rain going away for a change. <laughs> oh, come on, this is Northern Ireland. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a Northern Irish Fair without a sprinkle of rain. Ah, no, we need a wee dab of rain. That's why it's so green over here. <laughs> well, I was invited over here by Aidan Campbell from uh, Foxborough. Uh, they've invited us over here and uh, we're staying with them at their house and they've looked after us for the, the week that we've been here and they, um, they really have looked after us, they spoilt us. So we're not wanting to go back, but we're going back tomorrow morning. So. Crow would also like to thank Derek for flying him and Mrs Crow over for the show. 
For next year's Northern Ireland Country Sports Fair, visit countrysportsfairs.com. And for more about the upcoming Irish Game Fair and Irish Country Lifestyle Festival this year, actually in the next few weeks, go to irishgamefair.com. Hey, there you go. Good shot, Maggie. Now, Andy Crow and I are not the only ones to have come out of Ireland in the last week. Field Sports Ireland is out too. We're shooting foxes, we're trapping magpies, and then we're shooting rabbits in this month's Field Sports Ireland. Jason Doyle has put together a Stephen Dunbar double bill as Stephen tidies up pests around the farm, protecting lambing sheep. Then he's off to a dairy farm where he's knocking over rabbits, and Jason reveals one of his big family secrets, his barbecue rabbit recipe. We've got news about the forthcoming lead ban in Ireland. Keep up with sport from across the water on Field Sports Ireland, episode 10. Worth a watch. Next up, from Ireland to the rest of the world of hunting and shooting, on YouTube it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. SRS Power knocks down a sneaky fox cub in a film that's been age-restricted by YouTube. There's nothing wrong with the film, it's a good clean kill, but it's a lesson that YouTube channels which show hunting and shooting should put in a paragraph of moral justification into the description if they want to avoid a ban. Wild Serbia is also after foxes day and night in this film, they shoot two dog foxes. Jonas Breda brings out a compilation film of small game hunting during the 27th 2018 season. He hunts roebuck, foxes and beaver south of Oslo in Norway. My old pal Michael Zommer has put a new series on YouTube called Walt and Wilt TV. He's about to bring out episode 4 about shooting in northern Germany. This is episode 3, Hunting Munchak in England. Lots in the snow this week despite it being summer. The Hunter Brothers join Wild Boar Fanatic in this throwback to the last driven big game season in Germany. They are in Woodland not far from where Michael Zommer is about to be. For a flavour of what it's like going after chamois in New Zealand, Lake Fork Guy talks talks through his first day with friends JT and Todd. There's a new episode of The Catapult Show with Gamekeeper John, including the Rochan device we offered as a competition prize, plus giveaways and other top tips. And finally, sorry I didn't give a plug to the Field Sports blog for this film when it came out. They interviewed me at one of our Rifle Skills Days. There are a handful of places to fill at both the Braces of Bristol and Swillingtons of Yorkshire Skills Days upcoming. Visit fchannel slash skills for more. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so, please pop over to our website, F Channel, as I called it before, fieldsportschannel.tv, the full name of the website where you can click to like us on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, you can subscribe to us on YouTube, and of course, you can pop your email address into our constant contact box at the bottom of the page and we'll contact you about this show field sports britain which is at 7 p.m uk time every wednesday plus you can back us go to fieldsportschannel.tv slash shares to find out about that i'll see you next week good hunting good shooting good fishing and goodbye